as you know, events like this, in initiatives such as our institute and our program simply cannot exist without the support of the leadership. And I've been privileged and blessed to have in my tenure with USC Marshall School of Business to be working with two of the most amazing individuals that I've had an opportunity to work with. The previous Dean, Dean Alice, and now under the new leadership of Dean Jeff Garrett. Jeff is a brilliant global uh, economist who sees the global trade as well-functioning engine that drives what global industry has become and global economy has become, underpinned by supply chain. So he's one of those leader who understands the role of the supply chain and also understand the importance of the global trade. And even before he started officially, I had a privilege to work with him, share the vision, and he's extremely supportive of everything that we have done and we're about to do in the near future. So without further ado, please give a very big round of applause to Dean Garrett. Come on up. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, and it's wonderful to be here. Um, this is a very special day for at least three reasons. Um, the first one is that this is the ninth Supply Chain Summit, but it is the first hybrid summit. And I think as Nick uh, aptly foreshadowed, everything we do in the future in higher education is going to have a hybrid element. So it's great to see uh, folks in person here on the beautiful USC campus this morning, but I know there are lots of people who are Zooming in. So to have the combination of Zoomies and Roomies uh, is a wonderful thing. Um, second, the, the timing of this event, I, I think it wouldn't be an overstatement to say that the timing of the event is exquisite. Um, if you think about the, the media headlines, I think both Carl and, and Nick already talked about this amazing development last week of the 24-7 uh, Port LA, but think about other supply chain stories a little further afield that are all at the top of the news. So, you know, uh, Apple is going to reduce production of iPhone 13. That's a pretty big development. Um, for those of you who've lived in England, you know they speak a different language than we do in the United States, and I'm Australian, so I try to translate. Here's the, here's the non-translation. There are the longest petrol queues since the OPEC shocks in England right now, and industrial production in China uh, is being curtailed because of power outages and power shortages at a time when I think all of us in our daily lives just know it's going to take longer for stuff to be de delivered to us. So, um, you know, it used, to be, uh, it used to be the case that supply chain was for nerds and geeks and ops folks. Uh, it's now at the top of the news headlines. Um, but the, the, third, the third reason today is a very special day is because it's actually a celebration. Um, I think many of you know that over the summer, we had the good fortune to announce uh, Randy Kendrick's $20 million transformative gift to create the Randall R. Kendrick Supply Chain Institute at USC. Um, there'll be other opportunities to, to, to applaud and thank Randy, but um, you know, Randy's an action person, so I think we all knew uh, that this event was going to be the real launch of the Supply Chain Institute, um, and it is. And for those of you who know Randy, you also know that he doesn't want us to bow down in celebration of his generosity and his vision and his wisdom. What he actually wants us to do is to get on with it and to leverage his gift to create bigger impact in the world, and that's what we're trying to do here today. Um, you know, the, the goal, I think the goal of all business schools is to combine the best of academia on campus with the best of industry engagement and industry relevance, and there's certainly no part of the Marshall School that does that better than the Supply Chain Institute. 
And so this is a, this is a wonderful day. We're really launching the Supply Chain Institute, which had incredible momentum before Randy's gift, but now we have the opportunity to take it to the next level. And our shared aspiration, and I think it's probably the shared aspiration of everybody in this room, is to make this the best program of its type in the world. So no pressure, Nick. Um, so those are three reasons today special. Let me do three words of thanks. First is to Carl as chair of the board. Um, business schools really are three-legged stools that have research, teaching and industry engagement. Your leadership, the board's leadership, makes that an equilateral triangle in the case of the Supply Chain Institute, and we're really lucky to have you and your fellow board members. It really, uh, it's just an in invaluable uh, to the work of the Institute. Second thanks is to Nick Vias. Um, Nick, leadership, dynamism, vision, energy on all dimensions, those are the key words I wrote down about you. And I think given, uh, given everything else that's going on, I just want to acknowledge that a, a really important part of Randy's gift was to endow Nick's position as director of the Institute. So I, want, I think I probably want to be the first person to congratulate you uh, on your position as the Randall R. Kendrick director of the Institute. And I left, I left the last thanks to last for a reason. It was, it's the most important, which is to Randy. Um, you know, Randy certainly inspires me and us with all he's doing in the private sector at ZBEC, just to watch the news, uh, some of the things that he's doing uh, in Texas are literally extraordinary. Um, but I'm also humbled by his, both his generosity and his down-to-earthness. Um, you know, often when people are really successful in life, they kind of change as human beings. There's no way Randy Kendrick will ever change as a human being, and that is truly humbling. Um, but the last part, and, and I know Randy would like it for me to say this, is that he's also challenging us, right? He's challenging us to do better. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the, my feeling about the best way to honor this gift is to leverage it for a better future by doing even better work. And that's why you're all here today. That's why everyone is zooming in. Um, so thank you, Randy. Now, let me pivot uh, for a second to the, the substance of the summit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm now pretty old, and I, I tend to have spend more time reflecting on my life. And for my adult life, um, I think technological change plus globalization are the two biggest things that have transformed the world in the last 40 years, no question about it. But something that's less well appreciated in general, and Nick and I bonded on this at moment one, um, is that I think supply chain is at the absolute vortex of both of those forces. Uh, the amount of technological change uh, in supply chain is incredible. I see some people nodding in the audience. But I also think that supply chain has been at the core uh, of the globalization that we've experienced since the mid-1980s. And if you think about consequences of that, um, I, I, off, I, I think about two simple ones. Uh, there are no, actually three simple ones. There are no doubt more. The first one is that it's globalization through supply chains that's lifted hundreds of millions, if not billions of people around the world out of poverty in the last 30 years. It wasn't the World Bank. It wasn't multilateral aid. It was the expansion of markets and the connection of markets through supply chains. The second thing that I, that I always say, and I'm always surprised, the reason I say it is that I'm always surprised how little it features in the public discourse about supply chains, is the fact that global supply chains have benefited every consumer in the world by offering them greater choice over better products at lower prices than ever before. And I think we need to, we need always to remember that. The third thing, and I'm speaking now as a political scientist, um, feature of global supply chains for me is that I actually think 
supply chains have been a source of incredible political stability in the world, uh, in particular uh, in the, the US-China relationship where the interdependencies between the two economies have made the stakes so high that managing the relationship has been the highest priority for both sides for a long time. So supply chains are really, really important. Fast forward to right now, no one talks about supply chains as being good things. They're problems, they're threats, we've got to fix them. All of the language is negative. And when I think about that, you know, my overall perspective on the pandemic is that it's accelerated trends that were already there in the world, but they have accelerated. And with respect to supply chains, I think there are three of those. The first one is if you look at, just look in the data, I think you probably all know this, that global trade and investment were actually already slowing down before the pandemic. Um, if you go back and look at the history, I think we'll probably see the period around the financial crisis of 2008, 9, 10 as the high point of globalization in this era and things were starting to stabilize and then slow down um, five, 10 years ago, but obviously that's accelerated now as a result of the pandemic. Second, the geopolitical tensions between the, between the US and China and their global impact, because they affect everybody on earth, they existed before the pandemic, but obviously that's been accelerated too uh, in, the last, in the last two years. Um, and then the third thing, back to uh, which I guess will be the, a core theme of this, this conference, it has to be, um, is that efficiency has become a really dirty word and we want to talk about resiliency instead. Um, and efficiency is all that bad stuff about markets and gee, we need to counteract those forces and, and resiliency is going to be the watchword. So, Slow down in globalization, US-China geopolitical tensions, let's talk about resiliency. I think those are three features of the COVID period. They're nowhere better embodied, I think, than in the semiconductor story that we, you know, that we all know so much about now. And you know, I didn't realize, maybe, we, maybe other people did realize, just how central chips were to everything that we do, right? I, I, I can understand why a chip shortage might uh, affect the production of iPhones, but I didn't know that chip shortages would slow down the global automobile industry more than anything else uh, in the world. That's quite extraordinary. Second, you know, just think about the Taiwanese company, uh, SCMC, largest chip maker in the world, Taiwan took incredible advantage of an opportunity to leverage American technology and to build world-class fabs in, um, in Taiwan. But if you think about it from a geopolitical standpoint, Taiwan's always been potentially the biggest flashpoint in the US-China relationship. <laughs> That's never been more true than today because of the value of the production that happens uh, on the island. Now, how are, how are the US and China responding to chip shortages? They're responding in exactly the same way, which is to say we've got to reshore all of this advanced manufacturing to the home country, not only for economic reasons, but for national security reasons as well. And I think that's another theme right now, that the division between business and the economy and national security has been completely blurred and a lot of things that are happening um, are, are happening both for economic and national security reasons. So I understand all of that, but I am worried about a pendulum overcorrection um, that we see now all the excesses of globalization and we say we've got to correct it um, and I'm just worried that we might go too far and I'd like us to try to find a nice balanced place in the middle. So here are a few caveats, um, uh, caveats about the rush to resilience, if that's what we're experiencing right now. Caveat one, and uh, Carl was very eloquent uh, in a conversation we had yesterday about this. The pandemic period is really unique. So that probably means we shouldn't generalize from it too much. 
And the two elements of uniqueness that, that Carl mentioned, and I think these are just spot on. On the one hand, right now, we're seeing surging demand for everything on Earth, right? It's, a, it's literally, the pandemic recession and recovery is literally V-shaped. We've never seen anything like that before. So the demand side is going through the roof. But we cannot match that on the supply side because COVID has disrupted production everywhere. So, yes, we have enormous supply-demand mismatch right now. The question, I think, is how do you respond to that? And we could certainly, there is certainly a very powerful argument for, for two things, but I think that these arguments were powerful even before COVID. We should diversify supply chains and we should shorten supply chains. No question about that. But does that mean we should reshore everything? Uh, something that's going to be a big debate, certainly in the United States. And my answer would be, well, we should reshore some things, but maybe not everything. So when it comes to advanced manufacturing, uh, let's go back to the chips example. You know, the fact that the US lost it, the US developed all the chip technology, but then didn't develop, didn't leverage that into advanced manufacturing, that was a giant mistake. We now know that we've got to try to reverse that. It'll be hard, of course, but it, it's, a, it's a worthwhile goal. But I'm not sure we, our response to every shortage even of critical stuff should be reshoring. The other concept out there would be stockpiling. And you, know, you, can, you can understand, a, I think in retrospect, we know that the stockpiling strategy of the US on a whole number of dimensions was really inadequate. So I just like to add stockpiling to reshoring as a potential, uh, as a potential domestic res resilient response to supply chains. Um, and then more, more broadly, um, you know, I'm a political scientist by training, but I, I've, I've, my, certainly my career and my thinking has been most affected by the core economics. And we're living in a really, from a, if you're an economist, we are living in a really weird period right now in which two things that economists have believed for 200 years were really dumb are now considered absolutely essential. One is some version of protectionism of the domestic market, protection of the domestic market. And the second is industrial policy, where government picks winners and losers, makes investments in specific industrial sectors. Every economics textbook we've all read has said, boy, that's done. Right now, it's the flavor of the month. My expectation is that the, over time, the power of free markets and free trade will be reasserted. It, to my mind, there's no question about that. That doesn't mean that there's no role for government. Absolutely, there's a role for government. But I, I think, you know, for, for people who are into industrial policy, just go and go back and look at what the US said about Japan and Europe in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. The, the US assertion, which I think was borne out to be correct, was that the problem with those economies was that the government was picking winners and losers and had too much of a hand in the market and that and the US benefited enormously from being way more market oriented than was true in other advanced economies. Right now, we don't feel that, right? We're saying we need we look to government because government has to help us through this crisis. Carl is right, the crisis is real, but the crisis is unique. So let's try to take a longer view rather than a shorter view when it comes to what we should do going forward. So that's my, that's my two cents on substance of this, of this conference. I'm gonna end where I started with why this is such a special occasion. You know, I don't wanna to be too dramatic about it, but I think this is a pivotal moment in world history we're living through not just economic history, not just business history, not just supply chains. This is a pivotal moment. But it's a pivotal moment in which supply chains are front and center. And I also think that as a result, the decisions that we make in the next few months, in the next few years, are likely to have enduring consequences for decades. So there could never be a better time, I think, for this summit 
And you know, I've spoken too long. Nick allowed me, uh, I've, the life of a dean is one in which you just run from meeting to meeting. So Nick was very generous in allowing me to jump him in my British queue. Um, he's now going to introduce the substance of the summit, but, but I hope my remarks on both dimensions, one institutionally, how important this institute and this summit is, um, and then on the substance side, the, the stuff that you're talking about is critical to the, to the future of the world. I, I, hope, um, I hope everybody embraces both elements of that. Uh, and I'm real, on, on behalf of the school and as dean of the school, I'm really pleased to have been able to steal the podium for several minutes to, to muse a little bit. But now I'll get out of the way and I'll, 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 I'll leave you all in much better hands, those, the hands of Nick Bias.